Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, boys and girls, sometimes this job can be pretty fun, and uh, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more, as always. My name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we uh, sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals uh, and pick their brain, not just about their current projects, but uh, state of the industry, what they've done, influences... The whole nine yards, because, and we do it in a light and conversational fashion, because that's that's how we like to do it. Uh, And if you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, which is something we'd really like you to do, uh, you can do that uh, basically anywhere you find your podcasts, over at Amazon, over at Spotify, over at Apple, uh, Google, they're all good. And plus, you can find every single one of our episodes uh, archived over at our YouTube channel. Also... It would be fantastic if you could follow us over on the social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram at either at In the Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. And finally, and dare I say most importantly, uh, would you do us the kindness of visiting us over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca, where our hardworking team is cracking away on movie news, reviews from the land of VOD, theatrical, and beyond, a little bit of TV, too, and basically anything that the moving image has to offer, because that's just kind of how we roll. Uh, And uh, we hope that you roll that way, too, because uh, God knows we need stuff to watch. That is is the way of the world, and we want to recommend stuff to you. That's kind of how we roll. But uh, this one's a treat. This episode is a real, real treat. Uh, We're talking about the film Alice Fades Away, which is on VOD platforms now. Uh, And it is a a fantastic little, uh, like it's an edgy little thriller where uh, young Alice Sullivan takes uh, refuge on her uncle's farm, which is now home to uh, uh, World War II survivors suffering from uh, PTSD. Uh, It is after the war. Uh, And she's taken in by residents until uh, Holden, this... This murderous figure from her past arrives, and his mission is to return Alice's son, uh, Logan, to his grandfather, who is the wealthy patriarch of, uh, of the dangerous, uh, of, of her dangerous family, who has a lot of influence, and Alice's uh, increasing paranoia, and it just, it, it forces the residents of the farm to make a decision to stand up for her and protect her, or to, to give her over to uh this this unstable and violent man it's a it's a unique thriller and uh we got to talk with uh, the grandfather the wealthy patriarch of this dangerous family who is played by the indomitable william sadler who you may know from films like die hard 2 from trespass from demon knight the man is an icon throughout cinema and beyond and uh he is a working actor he uh, he loves to work and he's that kind of guy and we got the unique pleasure of sitting down to talk to him not about only about this movie but about his career in general which has kind of been a fun one uh and just uh we just a uh, fair warning we did have a little bit of technical difficulty on this one but uh, we've cleaned it up as best we can and we think uh, we think you'll enjoy it because i certainly know that i did well i mean obviously first so off, what can i do for you well i just talk a little bit about it's alice fine fades thursday away. talk a little bit about alice fades away talk a little bit about yourself <laughs> that kind of stuff if you're up for it oh well, well sure <laughs> <laughs> um have we have we begun? Uh, well, my internet connection like obviously just congratulations stable. On, congratulations on the film. Yeah. I guess just walk me through sort of uh, how the script hit your desk and what kind of drew you in to want to take part in it. Well, I was I was kind of fascinated by the by the character. I, first of all, I love that period. It's set right after uh, World War One. Yeah, and it's in that you know, this sort of Bonnie and Clyde world, there's America was still pretty wild. Um, and I love, I don't know, I love the clothes. I love the music. I love that. That period has a, a lot of charm, but I thought the character was, it was fascinating. Anytime I see a, somebody who's uh, there, this is a wealthy, powerful, competent person. Yeah who's used to getting 
his way, whatever it is, you know, he, in business and, you know, in his marriage, I'm sure he was a top freaking tyrant. Um, and this, he has no control over this. He can't. And, and it's, and it's something that he, his uh, grandson is. But I mean, I love that you say oh. just in terms of, uh, uh, the character, because there is this really interesting dynamic of playing a guy who, like you say, is almost sitting on his throne on high, but has zero control over what's happening below him, especially when it comes to his family. Yeah. Well, that was what it was. That was initially what I found attractive about it. And, um, and I'm, I tend to be drawn to the, to strong stories and, and interest, you know, if the character is interesting, um, uh, you know, that's really what I enjoy. Was it a bit was it a long shoot? I can imagine it was something you'd probably have to sort of jump in and jump out, necessarily get rehearsal time or time to sort of get into the groove of it all. No, they um, they they actually uh, We're only no, it wasn't a, audio. it wasn't a long shoot. The the producers and pro projects are are mostly um, very. Uh, they try to get me in and out. They don't, they don't, they don't really want me hanging around for weeks and weeks. Um, so I, I tend to be, um, I don't know, it's more expensive for them to keep me there, but it's also, if I can get in and do it and get out, um, I'm more likely to say yes, <laughs> you know, um, but, but I, but I enjoy, I love the script and I like the people involved. I thought it was uh, I thought it was terrific. So, um, so I went for it. Is that the root of it all? When you and I and I was very pleased. I was I was very pleased with the way it came out. I thought it was. I think it's a beautifully shot film. I love gorgeous. The, yeah, cinematography. No, no, it's a gorgeous film. You're absolutely right. No, but just to, to what you were saying before. I mean, it is really a, a, a kind of beautiful. It really is a beautifully shot film. It's got this very distinct sort of stark look to it all and i mean i'm kind of curious from your perspective when when you're looking at stuff is it is it story is it character is it oh i can meet it out in a week like when you're trying to sort of judge like what kind of parts you take on i'm always kind of curious sort of the process i get excited about, i get excited about character i get excited about uh and i get excited about story um that's uh um, those are the those are really the two things, and and I I mean the other reason uh, um, is if it's somebody that I've never worked with before that I'm that I'm jazzed to get, in, uh, um, you know, like I, I did the blacklist because I had never worked with uh, James Spader, and I wanted to because I've admired his work for so long, and I think. Um, I will occasionally take a job just because <laughs> I've never worked with, you know. <laughs> Um, it's because it's great. It's because it's great to mix it up with people that are better than you, that are that are, or or on your level, or you know, they're they're really good at what they do. Because everybody brings their A game, um, and it you know, it's just it's just more fun. So, is yeah. that what gravitates it to the bad guy a lot of times? Because it is more fun. Well, bad guys are a blast. <laughs> That bad guys are great fun to play. I have to tell you. I mean, if you're not going to be James Bond, then be Doctor No. Don't you know? You don't want to be the henchman number five, right? You want to be Doctor No, because um, you get to use all of your, you know, all the colors in your crayon box. Um, they take. I, I don't know. Bad guys make up their own rules. Um, I find, I find, and you also don't, you don't, you never think of them as bad guys. You, they're, um, you know, they're just, I, you can't, uh, I don't think I've ever played a, a villain that was just, no, yeah, you, you try to flesh them out and make them, a, you know, a big, fat, believable character um, so that the audience believes the threat you know, you have to, sure. that's, that's my entire philosophy of acting is if I can get them to believe 
that I, I am who I'm pretending to be and I'm doing what I'm pretending to be doing. The, I mean, if I can get the audience to believe just a little bit, it can be a horror film. It doesn't matter. Once, once they're believing you a bit, um, they're along for the ride. So that's that's sort of how I approach it. No, I mean, the first film I think I remember seeing you in, which took me along for the ride, I think it was Hard to Kill. And you had that iconic line that you kept sort of throwing back at everybody. And you've had a career of, of lines in so many of the different characters that you've played. And I'm kind of curious, like sort of when you're on the street, what lines come back at you from your films? You can take that to the bank. Um, <laughs> uh, Alexander Dumbass <laughs> comes back at me all the time. Um, you might be a king or a little street sweeper, but sooner or later you dance with the reaper. Um, That's a good one. <laughs> I, think, I, don't, I don't think, uh, I mean, that's that's just three of them. There were, um, it's always fun when those those words get planted in people's heads and they, they throw them back at you. I had a, I had, Fun story. Go for it. Film fact. Um, in 1991, they executed a guy named, that's well, not such a fun fact, is it? Named Robert Alton Harris in California. And his final words, the, when the warden read his final words, they were, you might be a king or a little street sweeper, but sooner or later you dance with the reaper. And Bogus Journey had just come out. And they said, um, and the press started to call me and say, you know, how do you, how do you feel? You wrote this guy's last word. Cause the, I had added that little, um, that little piece, that little couplet, the Reaper rap. And, uh, and I said, I, I hate to lose a fan under any circumstances, but you know, I guess if I'd known, if I'd known they were going to be his last words, I would have, you know, worked at it more. <laughs> something i'm glad i'm glad he i'm glad he found some comfort there Spe speaking of, speaking of which <laughs> but you're right those we, the words we, do come back at you no um, it, it's a it's an amazing subway platform across street and so on <laughs> were you amazed to get that call to sort of re revisit the reaper because i mean of, of all your characters i could imagine that that was one that you didn't expect to sort of see again <laughs> Not after 30 years, I was, I was pretty sure that one was dead. Um, no, yeah, I was surprised. I was surprised to get the call. Ed Solomon, the, one of the writers called, wrote to me and said, are you still interested in, you know, would you still be interested in playing the Reaper? Because we're writing the third Bill and Ted movie. And he described the story. Um, and I said, well, I, that sounds phenomenal <laughs> it sounds like the reaper was one of the most fun characters i've ever played he's you know huge and funny i got i don't get to be funny very often in films but i got to be funny in that and uh, that was just it's just a kick it's just you know it's the most fun you can have wearing big black robes <laughs> Now, this is something I always like to ask, because, I mean, I was doing my research and you started, correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of like very off Broadway in Boston doing theater. And I'm kind of curious, what was the ultimate drive for you to sort of become an actor? Like, what was the inspiration for you to go, you know what, I want to get on the stage and I want to do this? Um, I think I, I had been trying to get on the stage in one fashion or another through high school. I was... I was doing stand-up comedy. I played the banjo and told jokes. I was banjo Bill Sadler around Buffalo. Um, I was in a folk band. I was in a garage band called the Night Riders. And we used to play at dances and so on. I, I, I kept getting up there, but it wasn't until I discovered acting that uh, I, I, was, I was blown away by what there were out there in that world um it was once once that door opened for me um i mean back in you know i was still in high school i was or i, I went to geneseo state college and doing 
Shakespeare and Chad, you know, Brendan Behan, and I'm exploring all of these wonderful, you know, Samuel Beckett, all of a sudden, this, this universe of uh, literature opened up um, that I was just not aware of. I, and, and when you, when you take on a character and you sort of reverse engineer um, the dialogue. So what, what you start with is this block of, you know, the character says this, um, and you have to figure out, you know, why, why would someone say that? Why would it come out that way? Um, what sort of person would, uh, you know, would make a comment like that? How would he have to, and you sort of reverse and you, you sort of explore yourself to find the, <laughs> how to get into this guy. And I just found it, I found it endlessly fascinating creating characters and, and learning about human nature. Um, it was, it was really, a, I, grew, I grew up in a family that didn't, uh, I mean, there was a lot of love and there was a lot of uh, music and so on, but, but nobody talked about, um, you know, emotions or um, there were lots of stuff that was sort of off limits that didn't get spoken of. And my parents got divorced when I was still in high school or just going away to college. And it just came out of the blue. And so there was a part of this farm boy at 18 years old who I really needed to hear from grownups how the world works, you know? Someone, someone has to explain this to me because I just didn't under, I just didn't know, I didn't understand um, how humans worked. And this looked like, a, and, and plays were a wonderful place to, to look. The, the second play I did was called The Subject Was Roses. It was a beautiful little drama, Pulitzer Prize winning drama about a kid who comes back from the army uh, to live with his parents, his, his mom and his dad, and his dad is an abusive drunk. And it's, the, and it's just this three character piece. And when he comes back, he can't, he's not gonna sit still for all of this. He sees them with fresh eyes. And it's, it was the play that launched Martin Sheen on Broadway. And it just ripped my eyes open. It was just like, wow, you know, this, there's a universe out there that I was not aware of, you know, not all telling jokes and playing the banjo. <laughs> Does that make any sense? I, no, it does, man. That's a, that's a beautiful story. Are you and, still there? Have you gone to oh, sleep? I'm still here. No, no, no. Just, uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, like, I'm always kind of fascinated just why people sort of dive into the art form and how they get started. And I look back through your CV, and, I mean, you've got so many credits. And, I, like, I'm kind of curious. Is there a job that got away? Or as an actor, can you think, can you think in those terms? You just have to keep going to the next one. I keep. I used to beat myself up to get angry at casting people. I would, I would hear from my agents, well, they, they need a name for that role. And I'm, and I kept thinking, well, I've got a fucking name, yeah, you right know, you <laughs> I've got, I've got a name. <laughs> What's the matter with that? And um, I, yeah, was there, has there, was there a job? I have, no, I don't, you can't really, you can't carry those things around. I can't think of a job right now that I said no to that went on to win Academy Awards or, you know, um, yeah. No, they've just been, I, I've, I've been very lucky. I keep, I keep working with good people. Um, I've had some fantastic lucky breaks here and there. Uh, when I did the very first Tales from the Crypt, The yeah. Man Who Was Death, that Walter Hill directed. Um, I had done a couple movies before that, but when, but that was the first time I looked right into the lens and gave these big long monologues um, as a murderer. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, one of the guys, one of the writers on the show was Frank Darabont, who came up to me and said, I'm doing uh, this movie called The Shawshank Redemption. I'd like you to, I'd like you to be in that. And then uh, Walter Hill went on to do 
um, trespass with me. Uh, the next thing that Joel Silver, he was one of the executive producers on the thing. The next thing he did was Die Hard 2, and he cast me as the villain. So it was like this, this moment that kind of, you know, all of a sudden I was a, 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 a you know, or something. And, and yeah, I've been... I've been lucky. I don't have any, I can't think of any jobs that I turned down that, uh, that I regret turning down. Is there you can't wallow in that shit anyway. <laughs> Is there anything you can and you think never quite got the I mean, love? That'll, that'll just kill you. <laughs> I'm sorry. In your canon, is it like? Was there any what? In your career, is there any part that you've played that you think you were expecting it to maybe get a little bit more love, or never quite got the appreciation you thought the, that the project deserved? There's a funny recurring theme in my career. I keep doing, I keep doing projects that don't, um, like well, like Shawshank did. Like Shawshank came out in the in the theaters, and went away. Yeah, it it just yeah. you know it had a tiny little run in the in the theaters, and then it disappeared. And if it hadn't been for cable TV and the, the Academy Award nominations and all of that, it it might have you know never found the it found. I did a movie called Demon Knight, Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight that I thought was uh, <coughs> I thought that was a really fun movie um that kind of it came out and it had a, it had a little run and then it disappeared and i didn't see it again for like 25 years and all of a sudden it's like um you know this cult you know everybody I said, oh my god it's got it sort of got rediscovered um by a whole new audience um yeah yeah, I guess as far as things not getting the not getting the attention or the love that they that I thought they should have, I thought Trespass kind of went down without a bubble. No, I think I'm, that's I'm a better movie that, than. Yeah. I love um, Trespass. It came. It came. Part well, part of the problem was it was originally called Looters, and it came out just as the L.A. riots started, so they couldn't. They couldn't call it looters anymore. They called it trespass. And that name doesn't really sing either. But again, it was this, it's this wonderful, gritty Walter Hill action. And it's like a modern day treasure of the Sierra Madre. Um, and I, I guess I was expecting, I was expecting more. I thought, I thought that that would have, uh, make a bigger splash when it came out. And the stuff you did with Walter, obviously, that never really does get the love it does deserve because, I mean, especially Trespass, it's such a contained little thriller with you and Bill sort of bouncing off each other in this fantastic high energy way. Yeah, no, I, it was it was great. Um, it was it was great fun to shoot to to film that thing. I mean, it was rough and tumble and you know dive behind a table you know bill and i scrambling to get behind a beam and then there's this special effects guy sitting there with an air rifle next to the camera firing uh you know dust hits and zirconium hits at the beam that you're hiding behind there's sparks flying everywhere it was, it was great fun it's the stuff you know i i spent my entire childhood on the farm diving out of the hayloft with my BB gun and coming up shooting. So I, I'd been rehearsing for that movie on my whole, my whole childhood. Um, <laughs> I love it. I don't know. Walter once said to me, Walter once said to me, he's, uh, uh, they, my movies do, my movies, my movies always do well enough so that they'll let me make another movie. <laughs> and and he said, and that's fine. And like, I get to make movies, you know. Is um, that? Can you apply that to being? They an always actor? make. I suppose, and I don't. I don't know. Because um, you've worked pretty consistently. I mean, I'm kind of curious. Like, do you think there's a formula or a secret, or is it a, a simple question of just wanting to work and being engaged with material as much as humanly possible? I, 
let's see. Well, I've sort of, I'm, I'm, I've done enough now that there's a couple of generations of audiences have seen, you know, are aware of my work. Um, so it's getting easier. People, <laughs> people just call up and offer me stuff now. <laughs> and I decided whether I want to do it. I haven't done much. I haven't done much. Well, wow. yeah. I did finish a movie for Screen Gems, Screen Gems called, I believe the new title is The Unholy. Um, it was originally called Shrine and uh, it's kind of a horror, uh, a horror thing. It's like I play a Catholic priest who um, deals with demons and... Uh, <laughs> And it does, and it doesn't end well for him, as you might imagine. The, the demons are really freaking strong. But I, I don't know. I love, I, I love work. I love working. I love the craft. I love the, uh, uh, you know. I love, uh, I love doing the acting. I've never liked the business, of the business. You know. Yeah negotiations and the auditioning and the you know it's not you know it's not enough money but they really love you but they um you know on and on and on and that happens at every single time you work um but but the actual doing of it has gotten more and more fun as i've uh, you know as i go along i just enjoy it more i'm freer now I don't worry about things. I just kind of, <laughs> I just kind of do it. Well, um, you know what? I think that's a good so, note. And, uh, brother, I think that's a good go note. There. Um, Cause I mean, keep up the good work and keep doing the good work. I mean, I've been a fan for years and I, I'm glad to hear you're having more fun the, the more you keep working. So please keep on working. <laughs> I'm going to, as long as they keep the, uh, you know, I can keep a couple words in my head. <laughs> like as long as they keep calling i guess i'll keep doing this oh thanks for the time again man and congratulations well, nice to meet you Alice. nice to meet you sure sure thanks david and don't forget to uh, to visit our friends over at bay street video for all your dvd blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well over at 1172 bay street toronto ontario canada you can give them a call at 416-964-9088 that's 416-964-9088 or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your dvd and blu-ray needs